Hello, everyone. Um, thanks. And um, a few words about me. Um, so my name is Florian Wilhelm, and uh, yeah, I'm a data scientist at Innovex. Innovex is an IT project house in Germany. And uh, yeah, its focus is on digital transformation. So we have projects uh, in, in the fields of big data engineering and data science, but also web, mobile, and so on. In my spare time, I like to contribute to the PyData stack. And I also am the creator of Pi Scaffold, and I really found it cool that this uh, that Pi Scaffold was actually mentioned a few times in some of the talks. So, um, short hand up: has, uh, Who of you have has used uh, Pi Scaffold? Just to <laughs> okay, only a few. <laughs> okay, but um, to the actual talk. So. Um, the outline is uh, first give a small motivation and um, about declarative thinking, about the concept behind this. Then I'll show some examples in Python, how you can actually apply this way of thinking. And in the end, uh, I conclude with a little math riddle. So everyone likes riddles, hopefully. So let's assume you just moved to another city. And after all the moving business, you want to, to uh, make a little housewarming party and invite your friends. So let's say you have two friends, two best friends, uh, Alice and Bob. And you know that Alice, she's really good with tech and so on, so you just send her an email with your new address saying, okay, please come over, I wanna make a little housewarming party and be there at that time, uh, that date. And you know she will be all right, she will use Google Maps or whatever to figure out how to get to, uh, your, uh, to your new address and to be on time. But let's say with good old Bob, it's a bit, it's, it's a different kind of story. So he's, uh, let's say, barely able to, to write emails, so you send him not only um, an email with, your, um, with a new address and place and date, you also make the whole trip planning for him. Let's say you say, okay, it would be co best if you take that train from your city to, uh, to, 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 to my new city, and then leave the main station, take this tram and the dead bus, and finally you will arrive on time. So with this example, we directly see, so we interacted completely differently with Alice and Bob. So with Alice, we more or less stated what we want of her, we declared what we want of her, and with Bob, we not only told him that he should be at the housewarming party, we also defined how he should ac actually accomplish the task. But it's not always that easy to tell the how from the what, and the how clearly is more an imperative way, and the what is more in declarative way. So to see this, um, let's take a look again what our actual task was in this case, in this example. So. We were, we, our task was to do a, uh, to plan a, like a housewarming dinner. So we have different tasks like to clean up the mess, uh, find an easy recipe to cook for your friends, put the last remaining boxes in the basement, buy maybe more beer. And one of this, only one part of this was to invite um, your friends. So this is the kind of abstraction layer we are dealing with if we want to to invite, uh, to, to make a, a housewarming party. And we see that if we have given this abstraction layer, so with Alice, we stayed actually on that abstraction layer, and with Bob, it's a completely different kind of story. We went down to actually planning a trip for him. So clearly, we left this, um, this kind of layer of uh, making, um, of planning a housewarming party. And this is an important aspect, actually, uh, when talking about declarative thinking, that one has to think about the level of abstraction and where our tasks actually reside in. And we know this from many, there are many other examples, like if you want to take a picture, for instance, then um, your kind of abstraction layer is that you, you know how to, 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 to uh, handle a camera and you don't care about all the inner workings um, of how actually the, uh, the photo is created. And to be a bit more uh, techy, 
Um, I mean, we are in a more like tech-related conference, right? So maybe you remember like five or six years ago, there was this big hype about Hadoop, MapReduce, and everyone was so like hyped about this. Yeah, it's so cool. It's just two easy uh, building blocks, MapReduce, and you can do basically everything with it. But then later, people realized that, wait, so most of the tasks are actually more like query tasks, so more like SQL or SQL-related tasks. So having realized this, people realized, okay, so but to do something like, like, like queries, to do this in, in, in MapReduce, it's a lot of work, and it's actually not stating the problem anymore on that, uh, on that level. So people came up with things like Hive and Pig and, and you name it. So this is also an example that the, the uh, layer of abstraction is, is really important for this. So again, to sum this a little bit up, um, so I hope uh, I conveyed the, the idea behind this imperative and declarative thinking in a way that um, imperative is more like specializing on the how, and um, you can see this if you over-specify things, like when we talked to Bob, we said, okay, you should enter the train and stuff like this, which is completely unrelated to the actual task of giving a housewarming party and detailed instructions. And declarative is the, the more the what, and this is also related if we think about programming and um, also about design patterns. There was one talk about Python and design patterns, which I found really cool. And one of them is separation of concerns and the single level of abstraction. And those are also, also highly connected to declarative thinking and programming, meaning that you want to keep you want to modularize your code, you want to make sure that, you're all, uh, that one part of your code is actually dealing only with one concern, and when you're calling, when you, when you write a function, that you stay with, uh, inside that function on the same level of abstraction, not going up and down all the layers. But this, of course, as I said, depends on the level of abstraction you're dealing with right now. So one... Um, one note about abstraction, there's the so-called uh, law of leaky abstractions by Spolsky. So this is actually more like an observation, so Americans tend to, to call everything a law. But this is more like an observation. <laughs> so he said that all non-trivial abstractions to some degree are leaky. And um, so from my experience, this is absolutely true. So... Um, I mean, many of you have surely used SQL and maybe have also tuned SQL, and you might have then realized that if you start with a slow query, you can sometimes do a lot of equivalent transformation of that query, and you end up having the same result, but the, the actual query is uh, some magnitude faster than before. And this is clearly leaky abstraction, because actually SQL should kind of um, cover the, the complexity below, and so that you can just state what you wanna what you wanna have, but sometimes it's then better to know what's going on beneath to to optimize something. And this is where even a language as old and as good uh, as SQL, so good for this one specific task, is um, is leaky. So this is something one should be aware of when talking about um, yeah when speaking about uh, abstractions. So, um, having now the idea of, uh, of decorative thinking, I want to give some small, um, yeah, some small examples in Python. So, some uh, quite easy examples. So, let's say our task is to get a list of squared numbers from 1 to 10. And imperative, and maybe something someone coming from C or Java would maybe do is, you would create an empty list and you would just say, you just loop over it and append um, the squared numbers of 1 to 10. And this clearly is imperative because we are, we are I mean, our task is just saying we want some, some kind of list. And uh, by here, we are over specifying. We're giving an order of how we want to do it. And um, a more declarative approach would surely be just to use list comprehension as you surely all know and love uh, list comprehension because they're so easy to use, they're much more readable, 
and actually we are staying more on the level of our task. So we're basically transforming the task of getting a list of squared numbers from 1 to 10 directly to, um, to the syntax. And this has many advantages, so one could think that this could also be paralyzed. I mean, it's not paralyzed uh, right now in CPython, but I mean, it could be possible. So someone could say, okay, we changed the code in, in the back, so under the, this abstraction layer, and do it in parallel. So this is um, also an advantage that it could be done, besides being more readable. Uh, another example would be, let's say you want to write some kind of uh, dispatcher. So given some argument, you want to call different functions on some value. And an imperative um, way of doing this would be just like, you check if arc is option A, then you call function A uh, with a value and so on. And if it's not the case, you call default. And also here we are giving an order and we are going down to um, a much lower level actually. So what would be better is to use a dictionary here. So some way more complex data type and that data type, a dictionary is actually more like a mathematical mapping. So you map one thing to another and I mean this is what we want to do if we want to write a dispatcher like this. So basically with the help of a dictionary you can just say okay we map um, one argument to a certain function and then we can just use the get uh, method of the dictionary to do this. So this would be way more declarative and even if we had a lot of options, this would even be faster because in the back um, it's, it's implemented with some kind of uh, hash map algorithm. So maybe a little bit more complicated um, example, let's say you wrote a paper, your paper is called B, and you want to see if someone stole from your paper. So you want to check your paper against the paper A, and the question is how would you do this? So of course the really naive approach would be you take each sentence from your paper B and check all the sentences from paper A and see if they're equivalent. So this would be an uh, algorithm if you do it like this with the complexity of O n squared um, or to the power of two. So um, quite, yeah, quite a huge complexity. And if you think a little bit more about the problem, you see that actually a good abstraction layer could be set theory. So given that uh, Python has also a set data type, you could then think of a better way to actually formulate your problem if you just want to compare the sentences and just put all the sentences of work A and work B into dictionaries and then finding um, the, the, the intersection is just as simple as this. And this is also a nice example where, like, if you think a little bit more in advance about what kind of problem you're dealing with and if you find the right abstraction layer for it, then um, it's actually much easier to write code and, um, yeah, it's actually uh, way more readable and in this case also way faster because also this will use some hashing magic. So another th thing you uh, experience quite often in the, in the Python ecosystem are configuration files. I mean, it was also mentioned, I think, in the, in the first Lightning talk and in other talks that in Python a lot of libraries like Sphinx and also SetupPy, setup tools, they use, um, <coughs> they use Python modules for configuration. And this is quite bad, I think, because a Python module, it's kind of hard to check, right? What happens in there, everything can happen. It's, it's a Turing complete way to do something as simple as a configuration. And um, for instance, uh, in IDE, so it was also mentioned in, in, in the PyCharm tutorial, of a PyCharm talk, that an IDE like, um, like PyCharm could not check what kind of requirements you put into SetupPy if you put it there directly. It's much easier to pass something like a requirements txt. txt. So um, I think the takeaway is here is that it's way easier to um, to use for configuration, a way, way declarative um, approach is to use something like YAML, some, some markup language, or TOML, for instance. Um, 
that is less powerful, so you have to kind of think more about your actual problem, how you want to set up the structure of your configuration, but you earn a lot with it. It's easier to check it and um, yeah, it's, it's way better. And this was also one of the reasons why I chose, um, I used for my uh, project uh, PPR, which is in Pi Scaffold, because there you can, instead of using a setup Pi, you can s use a setup.cfg uh, to do the actual configuration in a more, in a more um, declarative way. Okay, so coming from some like really simple um, Python example, um, let's uh, talk about a little math riddle. So you might know the, the German newspaper Die Zeit, so the time, and they have this little math riddles called uh, Lokalei, which, which is some kind of mixture word between uh, logic and Lorelei. I think Lorelei is some kind of mermaid that attracts you and then kills you. <laughs> so <laughs> this is kind of riddles you start and then you can't, you can't stop until you finally um, yeah, solve them <laughs> or, yeah, or gave up. And um, yeah, so this is a riddle and um, it's like crosswords but with numbers and we see here that uh, that, for instance, we have to make sure that the digit sum of, uh, of, uh, of A is horizontal C and that C is a prime number and so on. And one of my friends sent me um, this and, or showed me this and said, okay, how would you solve this with the help of a PC or with the help of Python? And this got me thinking and um, then I remembered like, yeah, back in the days at university, someone mentioned uh, Prolog and declarative programming and uh, uh, yeah, logical programming. So I thought, okay, maybe I look this up again and see um, what I can do and see if I can solve this staying on the same level of, um, of abstraction so that I basically just want to state what's in the riddle and in the end come up with a solution. So how many of you know Prolog? Maybe, ah, oh, okay, quite a, quite a lot. So uh, data log is actually just a subset of prolog and um, it's then it's easier so it is used to be able to reason more about uh, data log. It's a declarative and logical programming language. It's used to query uh, deductive databases, so databases where you just specify facts and certain rules and then you can um, ask this kind of knowledge database um, for certain facts if it can be deduced from whatever you've given before. And it actually has quite many use cases. So um, Microsoft is doing a lot of research in this regarding security, uh, network security, they're checking some kind of firewall rules with this. Then it's also used for data integration, information extraction, networking, program analysis, and of course, yeah, you can do it for, also use it for, uh, for silly riddles. And, um, there's a nice um, Python library actually called PyDatalog where you can just use it and run it um, as, a, as a Python module. And I just want to like, show a little bit how one would go about this and how it is possible to, to stay like, really at the level of, um, this, uh, uh, yeah, of the uh, conditions in the, in the riddle. So we saw that one of those conditions was that, uh, we, that some numbers are squared numbers. So how would you, how would you specify this with the help of PyDatalog? So you would just say that, um, that squared x is, uh, so x is squared if you can take the square root of it and if it's still an integer. And um, you read the leftmost um, uh, smaller than equal sign just as an if. So the operator is overloaded and it's best to just read it as an if. And you can see it's just like you're just stating it. So, and this is squared is now some kind of predicate for x. And um, it's some kind of, of set of some, you, you, by this you're defining some set, but this is all you need to know. And um, the same goes for divisible, if x is divisible by uh, y, and we can also check only for the remainder, it's divisible if you do this, and 
um, then it's equal to zero. So maybe it's something more interesting. How would you check if a number is prime? Um, we know that two is a prime number, so the plus operator is overloaded. We, so we, we therefore just check if or state that two is a prime number as a fact and for other numbers and three. And for the other numbers, we use a rule um, stating more or less that all numbers larger than three, which are uh, odd numbers, so not, this is the, the tilde, so the curly one, uh, not divisible by two. And if there's not any other factor between three and um, the square root of x, and this we define by this, uh, by the second last line, um, with some kind of recursion. So in the last line, we're basically saying, so if y plus two is smaller than um, some, some upper bounds, so some square root, and then we check all the numbers. And in just a few lines, we, we can state this lazily for all numbers. And since most of our um, conditions are defined on numbers and we are actually looking for the digits, we of course need to have some kind of mapping between digits and the actual numbers and this is really easy. So the digits, uh, the number of two digits is just uh, 10 times the first digits plus on and then plus the second. And uh, then we can just recursively define this for, um, yeah, for all um, digits for different number of digits. Here again, so, oh sorry, here at that point we would be now able um, with some more rules and so on to actually uh, just write down one uh, condition after another of the, of the riddle. And uh, here is a part where the leaky abstraction uh, bites us. So um, since what happens below is that um, what, uh, um, what PyDataLag does, it um, generates a whole list of solution candidates and starts eliminating them and so on. And um, if you start with the wrong kind of um, condition first, then it might happen that the list of candidates gets too, too uh, large at certain points. And um, then you can run out of a, uh, in, into an out of memory error or um, into a, or just a runtime is just uh, too long. So this is then some kind of leaky because actually it should play no role um, if we want to stay on this level. So uh, one thing to, to deal with this is to uh, define certain parts, so like these uh, partitions, these uh, colored partitions. And um, yeah, using these partitions in, now in case of this riddle, helps to keep the number of solutions low at all time, and then you just combine them. So just to give an um, example how this looks like, for the upper left corner, so for the blue corner, um, this is this uh, large enough to be read, so um, the, the first line a little um, larger. So this was C and we wanted that uh, the prime numbers, the two prime numbers, f uh, sorry, the two digits form a prime numbers. So in uh, pi do beta, in pi data log we can just easily state that a2 is a digit ranging from 1 to 10 because it's the start of a number, so it can't be 0 um, to 10, or sorry, 1 to 9 uh, and not 0 to 9. And a, the same goes for A3. And then we, we just can use um, the prime check, the prime rule that we have defined. Um, and by this we can for all um, yeah, for all conditions in our riddle, we can just uh, write them down. And actually, it's just like, as you see here, like each line in the box above is uh, more or less one of the conditions in, in the riddle. And it's really staying at this abstraction level. It's using no loops or over-specification. Um, it's just a declarative way of um, specifying a riddle. How would we query this now? It's really as easy as just saying um, just like print and the riddle. And the riddle is a combination of all those four boxes, which I have left out here. But you can uh, look this up. I'll later show a link. And you just say, OK, now um, give me the, the numbers, the digits for that fulfill all the constraints I have given you. And uh, then it will just come up with a solution. And not only. Uh, 
the solution. So if there were more than one solution, it would, would print all solutions. So we know now not only one solution, we, we are also sure that it's a unique solution, which also a really nice thing. And uh, yeah, if you follow the, the URL below, then you can also get the, the whole source code. And um, I think this, uh, so for me, this was a really nice experience to, to work with a logical programming language. And uh, yeah, maybe some of you got interested in this and wanna, wanna try this PyData log out or maybe prolog di directly. And uh, yeah, I wanna conclude that there are many other applications where actually declarative thinking and programming becomes much more important. So in one of the talks also Nixo OS was, um, was mentioned and this is one operation system where you have a declarative way of stating how you want your system to be. It's not like app get install and moving from one state to another, you have a declarative way. And this um, has gained quite some traction over the last year. Also, um, a tool set, a framework like TensorFlow, I mean, they, they included just the, the, the layer submodule where you can now easily define, like in a curious style of way, um, your, your network, because if you want to build a network, if you're on that la layer, you're not in interested in really all the details, how you do the matrix multiplication, so on. But it has, it now provides like two layers, like this uh, layer submodule where you can just define layers, and of course, also the low level parts with um, where you can do like almost everything that's possible with a linear algebra. And others, uh, yeah. And there's, for instance, also Luigi, which is kind of a competitor to, to Airflow, and this is also using a more um, declarative approach. So to, um, to make a small summary of the talk, so um, what are the advantages of a declarative way of programming and of thinking? Because actually it's, it's more like thinking. So in, in, in most cases you can actually improve the readability of your, of your code. You're, um, you're more like stating what you want, of course, and uh, keep it then to some other parts of the code to do this. It also reduces the number of errors most of the time because um, if you, for instance, if you write some query in SQL, if you would do this really with the help of um, some MapReduce or if you would try to, to mimic this uh, with your own code, you would surely end up having a lot of error and strange corner cases. In many cases, it's also increased performance because, um, I mean, as a user, you stay at the same level of, um, this, at one level of abstraction, and what happens below is then can be programmed by some domain expert, like, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, in case of SQL, it would be the relational algebra and so on. And um, yeah, and you're following the separation of concern. So the, the big takeaway message here is, um, so it's kind of my definition for me, how I think that declarative programming is, that declarative programming for me means finding the right abstraction layer, describing the problem, and then using this uh, layer. So thanks for your attention, and yeah, I'm welcome to hear questions if we have enough time. <laughs> Okay, we have about um, two minutes or so, not much, so I would take one question. So, who has a question? Ah, ah that saves us time. Okay, <laughs> ah, there is one. Hi, uh, you say that uh, data log is a subset of prolog. Uh, yeah. uh, what is missing? I mean, what... What yeah, are the feature or it's kind of those there's a, in Prolog this breaking uh, operator where you can kind of stop the computation and uh, this is uh, missing I think this is one of the the most important thing which is missing in in data log but I'm also I'm not an an expert in this um, yeah but uh, yeah okay thanks thanks all right that was it um, so give him a hand. And uh, remember to...